In this phone, there are nearly 100 million transistors. In this computer, there's over a billion. The transistor is in virtually every electronic device we use. TVs, radios, Tamagotchis. But how does it work? Well, the basic principle is actually incredibly simple. It works just like this switch. So it controls the flow of electric current. It can be off, so you could call that the zero state, or it could be on, the one state. And this is how all of our information is now stored and processed in zeros and ones, little bits of electric current. But unlike this switch, a transistor doesn't have any moving parts, and it also doesn't require a human controller. Furthermore, it can be switched on and off much more quickly than I can flick this switch. And finally, and most importantly, it is incredibly tiny. Well, this is all thanks to the miracle of semiconductors. Pure silicon is a semiconductor, which means it conducts electric current better than insulators, but not as well as metals. And this is because an atom of silicon has four electrons in its outermost or valence shell. This is how we represent an electron visually. The particle itself is a fundamental particle and is too small to be seen by any imaginable instrument of observation. So we instead represent the properties that allow the electron to interact. The central small dot represents the weak charge of the electron. The larger volume of shifting purple is meant to represent the electric charge of the electron. This charge is the generator of the electromagnetic force which has infinite range, although the drop-off of strength is pretty dramatic as we move away from the electron. The electromagnetic force is how electrons interact with other electrically charged particles and with magnetic fields. These interactions make the structure of atoms and molecules possible. This gives rise to almost all of the complexity that we see around us. This is our depiction of a proton. It is composed of two up quarks and one down quark, as you can see from the tiny rings of color near the center of the quark. This is our depiction of a neutron. It is composed of two down quarks and one up quark, as you can see from the tiny rings of color near the center of the quark. The red, green, and blue colors of the quarks represent a property that attracts them to one another. It is this color charge property of the quarks that hold them together in a proton or a neutron. These protons and neutrons can then combine to form the nucleus of each element in the periodic table. One proton in the nucleus makes hydrogen. Two form helium. Six, carbon. Eight, oxygen. Neutrons help hold the protons together. Because of their electric charge, protons would repel each other more strongly if neutrons were not present. And the heavier elements would come apart. There are approximately as many neutrons in each element as there are protons. Atoms are formed when the positively charged protons in the nucleus capture the negative electrons. Neutral atoms capture one negative electron for each positive proton in the nucleus. So, hydrogen has one electron to go with its one proton. Helium, two electrons. Carbon has six. But electrons cannot just gather around in a crowd. Once again, the strange, wonderful world of the tiny has its idiosyncrasies. Electrons arrange themselves in shells inside an atom like the layers of an onion. And only two electrons can fit per layer. So the more electrons an atom has, the further away from the nucleus the outer shells must be. 
and that means these electrons are more loosely held. It is this difference in how tightly electrons are held in each different kind of atom that determines the chemical properties of the element. This accounts for the ability of metals to conduct electricity, the aloofness of noble gases, and the formation of molecules. I now want to look at the atom silicon, which sits here in the periodic table. You'll see that it's in the 3, n equals 3 level. It has two s electrons and two p electrons. And silicon has a structure which looks like this. Here is the valence band, which is full. Here is the conduction band, which is empty. But the gap now is only about one electron volt. And at room temperature, where the photons will have an average energy of a 40th of an electron volt, that still is too big for the electrons to jump across. Because an atom of silicon has four electrons in its outermost or valence shell. And this allows it to form bonds with its four nearest neighbors. Howdy ho there. Good eye. What's up? So it forms a tetrahedral crystal. But since all these electrons are stuck in bonds, few ever get enough energy to escape their bonds and travel through the lattice. Of course, a few will, because we know that the molecules in the air won't all be at the same energy. So having a small number of mobile charges is what makes silicon a semiconductor. Now this wouldn't be all that useful without a semiconductor's secret weapon, doping. Now silicon, because it, is, because it has four electrons in its outer level, structures itself rather like this. You have four bonds coming from silicon, each of which can bond to another silicon atom. And so you can end up with an array of silicons, each with four bonds, and that becomes the silicon crystal. Now, by technology, which I'm not going to describe because I don't really understand it myself, what you can do is you can replace one atom of silicon by phosphorus. Phosphorus sits next to silicon in the periodic table. Silicon has four electrons in its outer shell. Phosphorus has five. You've probably heard of doping. It's when you inject a foreign substance in order to improve performance. Yeah, it's actually just like that, except on the atomic level. There are two types of doping, called n-type and p-type. To make n-type semiconductor, you take pure silicon and inject a small amount of an element with five valence electrons, like phosphorus. This is useful because phosphorus is similar enough to silicon that it can fit into the lattice, but it brings with it an extra electron. So this means now the semiconductor has more mobile charges, and so it conducts current better. In p-type doping, an element with only three valence electrons is added to the lattice, like boron. Now this creates a hole, a place where there should be an electron, but there isn't. But this still increases the conductivity of the semiconductor because electrons can move into it. Now although it's the electrons that are moving, we like to talk about the holes moving around because there's far fewer of them. Now since the hole is the lack of an electron, it actually acts as a positive charge. And this is why p-type semiconductor is actually called p-type. The p stands for positive. It's positive charges, these holes, which are moving and conducting the current. Now it's a common misconception that n-type semiconductors are negatively charged and p-type semiconductors are positively charged. That's not true, they are both neutral because they have the same number of electrons and protons inside them. The n and the p actually just refer to the sign of charge that can move within them. So in n-type, it's negative electrons which can move, and in p-type, it's a positive hole that moves. But, but they're, they're both neutral. neutral. Here's an n-type, and here's a p-type. Actually, I'm going to do it the other way around. Here's a p-type, here's an n-type. To understand what semiconductor materials are, and how p-n junctions are fabricated, we need to dive into the atomic world. Currently, the most well-known semiconductor is silicon. In a silicon crystal, each atom is bonded to its neighbors by four electrons, forming covalent bonds. 
impurities can be introduced into the semiconductor, substituting atoms of a different atomic species for the silicon atoms. If the new atom has five electrons in its outer shell, four of them will replace the four electron bonds of silicon. The extra electron will be loosely bound to the impurity. At room temperature, this fifth electron is liberated from its original atom, becoming a conduction electron. Consequently, the impurity acquires a positive charge. This may result in the number of electrons in the doped material exceeding the number present in a pure semiconductor. The number of implanted impurities can be controlled using the fabrication technology. A semiconductor containing these impurities is called an N semiconductor, since it has negative charge carriers. The impurities are named donor impurities, since they donate electrons. An impurity with only three electrons in its outer shell can also be used. The three outer electrons complete three of the four bonds. The fourth bond remains unoccupied. However, at room temperature, the electrons from other bonds can move in to occupy this free space, creating a hole in the material and a negatively charged impurity. As in the previous case, the number of implanted impurities can be controlled using the fabrication technology. So the number of holes in this doped material can be much greater than the number of holes in a pure semiconductor. A semiconductor of this type is called a P-semiconductor because it has positive charge carriers. And these impurities are named acceptor impurities since they accept an electron. A p-n junction is a structure formed by neighboring regions with different dopings, p-type and n-type semiconductors. The p-n junction is a crucial part of many devices. To understand how this structure works and what physical processes take place in it, a didactic model is used. The model consists of a p-semiconductor perfectly matched to an n-semiconductor. The P semiconductor has a much higher hole concentration than the N semiconductor. Therefore, holes from the P region will diffuse into the N region. Similarly, electrons from the N region will diffuse into the P region. The diffusion of electrons and holes creates a region depleted of free charge particles, leaving behind the ionized impurities from which these charge particles come. The potential barrier is an obstacle for the diffusion current in the device. P, N. N, surplus of electrons. P, surplus of holes. What happens when you bring them together? Well, there's going to be a little bit of region here where the electrons in the N type will fill the holes in the P type and you get what's called a depletion layer. Now let's suppose I apply an electric circuit with a battery such that this is negative and this is positive. What happens? Well, all the electrons in the n-type uh, material will flow towards the positive charge. And all the holes, which of course are positively charged, in the p-type will flow in this direction. And that means that the depletion layer just gets bigger. And the effect is that nothing flows across that depletion layer. No current flows. To all intents and purposes, this is an infinite resistor. A transistor is made with both n-type and p-type semiconductors. A common configuration has n on the ends with p in the middle. Just like a switch, a transistor has an electrical contact at each end. Now at first sight, this is madness, because it's never going to work. Let's suppose we make that side negative and that side positive. Well, in those circumstances, the electrons here will want to move towards that positive charge. So they will move across there fine. The only trouble is that when you look at this section here, the electrons here have moved to that positive charge, the holes here have moved towards that negative charge, and this depletion layer has grown greater. And consequently, the electrons cannot get across that part. But instead of a mechanical switch, there is a third electrical contact called the gate, which is insulated from the semiconductor by an oxide layer. When a transistor is made, the N and P types don't keep to themselves. Electrons actually diffuse from the N type, where there are more of them, into the P type, 
to fill the holes. This creates something called the depletion layer. What's been depleted? Charges that can move. There are no more free electrons in the n-type. Why? Because they filled the holes in the p-type. Now this makes the p-type negative thanks to the added electrons. And this is important because the p-type will now repel any electrons that try to come across from the n-type. So the depletion layer actually acts as a barrier. This is madness, because it's never going to work. As a barrier, preventing the flow of electric current through the transistor. So right now the transistor is off, it's like an open switch, it's in the zero state. To turn it on, you have to apply a small positive voltage to the gate. This attracts the electrons over and overcomes that repulsion from the depletion layer. It actually shrinks the depletion layer so that electrons can move through and form a conducting channel. So the transistor is now on, it's in the one state. This is remarkable because just by exploiting the properties of a crystal, we've been able to create a switch that doesn't have any moving parts that can be turned on and off very quickly just with a voltage. And most importantly, it can be made tiny. Transistors today are only about 22 nanometers wide, which means they're only about 50 atoms across. But to keep up with Moore's law, they're going to have to keep getting smaller. Moore's law states that every two years, the number of transistors on a chip should double. And there is a limit. As those terminals get closer and closer together, quantum effects become important and electrons can actually tunnel from one side to the other. So you may not be able to make a barrier high enough to stop them from flowing. This is madness, because it's never going to work. Now this will be a real problem for the future of transistors, but we'll probably only face that another 10 years down the track. So until then, transistors, the way we know them, are going to keep getting better. Once you have, let's say, 300 of those qubits, then you have like 2 to the 300 classical bits, which is as many particles as there are in the universe. Well, this is all thanks to the miracle of semiconductors. This is madness, because it's never going to work. To summarize, PN junctions are ubiquitous in our environment, close and distant. It seems unbelievable that such a simple device is so useful and affects so much in our lives.